generous remarks and for the invitation to return to Vienna, one of my favorite cities. I had the opportunity last December to visit uh, Vienna just for purely recreational purposes. A friend had entered the lottery to uh, and won tickets to go to the New Year's Eve performance of the Vienna Philharmonic in the <laughs> Music Verein. And uh, that was quite an experience. And I had, uh, with John Michael last, last night, the opportunity to return to the Music Verein, quite a, quite a venue for classical music. Well, um, I'm going to talk today not about secretion and yeast. Uh, most of my lab now works on mammalian cells. Uh, we've moved into mammalian cells because there are many uh, opportunities to study pathology and human disease. And I'm going to give you one example of, uh, actually two examples, of uh, a rather different study on uh, the mechanism of protein turnover and uh, unconventional protein secretion in mammalian cells, which will surely have clinical manifestations. So our work continues and will always continue to be at a very basic mechanistic level. Um, the story that I'm going to tell you about to begin with started four years ago when I had uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, consider a, a, a fantastic postdoctoral fellow who wanted to join my lab for having studied cell biology in Shanghai. At the time, because of the U.S. State Department, he wasn't able to get a visa to come over for an interview. Normally I interview prospective postdocs. So instead, we, I conducted a two-hour Skype interview with this fellow. His name is Liang Ge. And I was so impressed that I offered him a position just over the Skype. And uh, after I had described all of the work going on in the lab at the time, I asked him what project he might like to join. And he said, well, frankly, nothing. There's, uh, I'd rather do something new and original. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I, I didn't take offense at this because I was so impressed with his, uh, with his enthusiasm. Uh, we discussed uh, over just a very brief uh, few minutes uh, opportunities, new opportunities to study the generation of membranes that precede the process of, aut that organize the process of autophagy. He immediately latched onto this. And so I'm going to tell you about the work that he's done over the past few years and then subsequently the work of another postdoctoral, uh, um, Min, Zhang, Min Zhang, who happens to be his wife. Uh, that also relates to the process of autophagy. Um, let, let's uh, begin with a brief dis discussion of uh, the pathway of autophagy, and I'll use this to highlight the issue that interested us, at least at the outset. So this is a pathway that I, I'm sure you all are, are aware of. Um, cells can be induced to produce a very large, unique membrane, a double envelope, spherical structure which collects uh, molecules and particles for turnover uh, by degradation in the lysosome. The process begins with the elaboration of a phagophore membrane that grows initially from some uh, membrane source within the cell, grows by the uh, uh, fusion of vesicles from possibly other sources to create an envelope that eventually encloses particles Within an inner membrane, uh, the outer mem after closure, the outer membrane is directed to fuse with the lysosomal membrane, and this internal large vesicle is uh, destroyed by turnover within the within the lysosome to generate uh, amino acids and sugars. Uh, but also, this uh, it serves an important signaling and, and regulatory role. There's a great deal of interest in the role of autophagy. Uh, in promoting or interfering with uh, 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 tumor cell growth, and so the pharmaceutical industry is busy generating agents that may interfere with this process and may have uh, efficacy in cancer chemotherapy. Now, our interest in this was very specific, and that is, where does this membrane come from? It's a very large, substantial membrane, and yet if you look at it by its composition, as it's forming, there are very few membrane markers that are characteristic of this structure that would give any clue as to its origin. The only molecules that are clearly associated with the structure that are unique are a series of lipidated uh, cytosolic proteins that mark the organelle and serve an important role in its function. But in trying to figure out where this membrane came from had, been, had proven very difficult. Over the years, many people using primarily visual techniques 
have uh, identified possible origins of this membrane. Uh, in most cases, uh, people have suggested that it comes from the ER, uh, but others have suggested it may come from the Golgi, um, others uh, the mitochondrial membrane, or adhesions between the mitochondrial membrane and the ER, or endosomal membranes, even the plasma membrane. It may be that many organelles contribute to the growth of this, uh, but the question is where does the membrane begin? And uh, since almost all of the conclusions that led to the, almost all of the techniques that led to the conclusions that I've mentioned were based on some visual inspection. Uh, Liang and I decided to try to devise a biochemical approach that would allow us to fractionate membranes from cells to find a functional source uh, of membranes that would give rise to the phagophore. So a more functional approach. We used uh, as our assay uh, the one known covalent event that is activated early after the induction of stress to uh, mark the phagophore membrane, the production of a lipidated form of a pro protein in mammals called LC3. This uh, has been studied in some detail uh, through enzymology uh, and by very simple techniques. One can monitor after cells initiate stress the formation of a lipidated form of LC3. Here, for instance, is one such uh, experiment done by Mizushima. The uh, process is fairly well understood. Um, uh, the genes that are required for the um, lipidation of uh, LC3, first described by Osumi in yeast and uh, subsequently shown to be true in mammalian cells, represent a, 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 a cascade uh, very similar to the cascade of uh, ubiquitilation. Ultimately, LC3 has its C-terminus clipped, and then a, a C-terminal glycine residue acquires through covalent, uh, covalent bond phosphatidylethanolamine that links LC3 to the membrane. This process can be studied in cells and in vitro. In cells, after initiation uh, uh, by starvation, uh, most of the LC3 gets lipidated. It migrates more rapidly on an SDS gel, so it's easy to evaluate. Much of the lipidated material collects on the concave face of the phagophore such that on closure and delivery to the lysosome, the LC3, the lipidated form of LC3, is consumed by degradation. And so one sees a decline, <coughs> declining signal as the uh, uh, starvation uh, reaction uh, con continues. Now, Osumi uh, in yeast has isolated all of the cytosolic components required for lipidation, and he initially showed some years ago that you could reproduce this all with synthetic membranes in vitro. Uh, but what uh, Liang uh, thought was that there, surely there is a more complex regulatory scheme that's imposed upon the lipidation reaction that had certainly been shown before in yeast and in mammalian cells. And what if one could reconstitute a cell-free reaction that reproduce not only the lipidation event, but all of the regulatory elements that precede lipidation of LC3. And so he decided to use a very simple approach, uh, which was to uh, use as a, a source of membranes uh, a mouse a mutant deficient in the last step in lipidation. The gene ATG5 knocked out is an embryonic lethal in the mouse, but uh, embryonic fibroblasts cultured from that mouse uh, grow perfectly normally, but they, are, they fail at a very early stage in autophagy. Those cells, which grow in the laboratory perfectly normally, can be used as a source of membranes. They'll, there will be no lipidated LC3 on those membranes. And so Liang felt if you use that as a source of membrane and mixed with that cytosol from starved wild-type cells, you might be able to reproduce the lipidation scheme, but now have the regulatory elements uh, also recapitulated in this reaction. So he did that, and uh, here is what I've just said. It's very simple. You take membranes from the ATG5 knockout, uh, MEF, and cytosol from starved or unstarved wild-type cells. You mix them together, uh, and in this case, he used a uh, recombinant source of the LC3 precursor with a T7 epitope tag. And uh, on mixing with cytosol, either from uh, mouse embryonic fibroblasts or from an established cell line, he was able to uh, see a, a robust production of a species that migrates as does lipidated LC3 
uh, but by other forms of ca characterization, he could show that this really was lipidated. One of the characteristics is that if you mutate the C-terminal glycine residue, it's no longer a substrate for lipidation, and that is seen in uh, these lanes. All right, well, that by itself is nothing new. I mean, after all, Osumi had done this many years earlier. What, what about this reaction gave us any comfort that it was measuring something larger than simply lipidation? Uh, he showed, uh, Leong showed that cytosol taken from starved uh, uh, fibroblasts is threefold more active in promoting the lipidation reaction than cytosol from unstarved cells. And we know from many other uh, labs that the enzymes of lipidation are not themselves subject to uh, changes in gene expression, and they are entirely cytosolic. So we suspected that that was a clue that this was a measuring an important reaction. But there are also unique biochemical uh, and genetic requirements that precede lipidation, one of which is the production of PI3 phosphate by a complex of enzymes, including the, uh, the one of the mammalian VPS34 uh, PI3 kinase subunits. That enzyme is exquisitely sensitive to inhibitors. 3-methyladenine and wortmannan uh, uh, block the, uh, the activity of that enzyme and block the formation of lipidated LC3 in vivo. And so what Leong did was then to ask whether his reaction was similarly sensitive to these inhibitors. And that's shown here. Sure enough, 3-methyladenine uh, at concentrations that are required to inhibit the, the kinase uh, in vivo and Wortmannan at much lower concentrations blocked the formation of lipidated LC3 in his cell-free system. And let me emphasize that these inhibitors do not block the lipidation of LC3 per se. They are blocking, however, this more complex reaction. He could then show that the product of PI3 phosphate is itself required to turn on or to capture the lipidation cascade. He did this by uh, isolating a recombinant form of a protein that contains the uh, five domain, the peptide domain that uh, reacts and binds specifically to the PI3 head group. Uh, a protein containing the five domain uh, interacts quite specifically with uh, PI3P on this lipid uh, strip, uh, but most importantly, uh, the normal protein in, in inhibits the lipidation of LC3 in our cell-free system, whereas a mutant form of the protein that no longer binds to the head group <coughs> is inactive in inhibiting uh, the reaction in vitro. So this and other forms of characterization convinced us that we were looking at something rather more complex than just the lipidation cascade, but that we had now been able to capture the events that precede and control lipidation, perhaps then uh, allowing us to measure the very early source of membranes required to serve as a template, a membrane donor uh, of PE that we would perhaps be able to isolate and, and characterize. So what Leon did over the next several months was to devise a fractionation scheme, starting with ATG5 null mess, to obtain a membrane fraction that was specific and potent uh, in serving as a template for the lipidation of LC3. The concern as we started this project was that PE is a pretty common lipid. It's found in all the membranes of the cell. And so by fractioning membranes, he might just be isolating any, any membrane that could serve as a source of PE. But as you'll see, that turned out not to be the case. So I'm going to summarize the scheme that he devised and then show you the last step in the scheme that uh, uh, resulted in the identification of a quite unexpected source of membrane serving as an active template. Um, so what Leong did was a classic fraction membrane fractionation scheme. And at each point, he measured the activity of membrane fractions in this lipidation reaction and compared that activity to the display of various marker proteins that are diagnostic of the full range of membranes in a lysate of these cultured cells. He found that the activity, over 50% of the lipidation activity, sediments at 25,000 times G. Um, um, but that membranes that sediment at very low speed or membranes that, are, that have to be centrifuged at very high speed were much less active in promoting lipidation. Um, this is still a fairly crude fraction. He then 
found that this material could be sedimented uh, at the, um, an interface between quarter and 1.1 molar sucrose, resolving membranes at that interface from those that pellet through 1.2 molar sucrose. And once again, this interface fraction was highly enriched in the template activity for lipidation. And finally, um, he then took this interface fraction and resolved it on a linear gradient of a material called optoprep. And I'll show you the data that shows the final separation of this activity and its marker proteins from others that contaminate it at this, uh, at this point. And let me, before I show you that, emphasize that these first two steps, even really just crude fractionation steps, essentially completely removed all of the endoplasmic reticulum in the lysate and removed all of the mitochondria from the lysate. And yet we were left with fractions very increasingly enriched in this lipidation material um, template. So here is the, uh, uh, the same fractionation scheme as I showed you. And uh, the last step, the optoprep gradient from the top low buoyant density fractions to the bottom, the activity that promotes lipidation fractionated in uh, 2, 3, and 4 uh, coincident or overlapping with two marker proteins that in uh, mammalian cells are characteristic of a structure called the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. The two that are used in this analysis are a snare protein called SEC22B that cycles between the ER and Golgi but tends to hang out primarily in the ergic compartment. And then a, a, a protein that itself also is required for secretion but which cycles through this ER to Golgi compartment. Other membranes that uh, were uh, further removed and uh, clearly resolved uh, are uh, transfer and receptor re recognizing some endosomal material. Uh, uh, a membrane source for another protein required for autophagy called ATG9, but clearly not in this fraction. Uh, peroxisomes, which contaminated the, the um, penultimate step. Uh, lysosomes, and even a marker of the cis-Golgi, quite nicely resolved from this fraction. So that's uh, you know, a, a strong statement, but it, at this point it's still correlation. Something co-sedimenting with, with an activity doesn't necessarily mean that, that it is the actual membrane. And so what Leong did was um, devise a, uh, an immunoaffinity isolation technique, starting with a very crude lysate, crude membrane fraction. He was able to immobilize an antibody against the cytoplasmically exposed uh, domain of SEC22 and immunodeplete from the extract most of the lipidation activity. He was able then to find associated with the SEC22 immobilized beads an enriched source of material competent for lipidation. So I'll show you that experiment, and then he did it again with a different marker showing the same thing. Oh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, so um, here is the immunoprecipitation experiment starting with a crude membrane fraction an antibody recognizing a, 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 a peptide from the cytoplasmic domain of SEC22 is immobilized. When that antibody is bound to beads, uh, a substantial enrichment in membranes associated, retained on the beads is active in lipidation, obviously enriched in SEC22B and enriched in another uh, ER Golgi intermediate compartment marker, whereas it's relatively depleted by this one step uh, of uh, a marker of the endosome. If the immunoprecipitation reaction is conducted in the presence of the peptide against which the antibody was raised to compete binding, little if any lipidation activity is recovered in the pellet fraction. And in parallel, he did the same exact experiment with a different marker of the ergic compartment, uh, in this case, um, a, a, a tagged form of a receptor called the KDEL receptor that cycles between the ER and Golgi, and the results were essentially the same. With the, uh, an antibody against the KDEL epitope, a flag antibody, very efficient precipitation of membranes, active in lipidation and in, other, uh, and in markers of the uh, membrane itself. Now, I mentioned at the outset that the concern in starting this project was the possibility that PE would just be distributed to all, all membranes and we wouldn't see any specificity. Clearly that wasn't the case. Uh, but then, of course, we had to go back and look during our fractionation at how PE uh, separates in the various steps. And I'll just return to the previous slide to show you that in the last, uh, the last, the optoprep gradient, where they're at low buoyant density fraction is enriched in this activity and in ergic markers, 
It's actually a, a little bit depleted in PE. M much of the residual PE in this last step sediments at high buoyant density. So clearly, it's not just PE. There must be something special about the membrane that uh, somehow directs the lipidation machinery uh, to initiate this process. So this is the ergic membrane. It's serving to receive material that buds from the ER and the uh, using a coat protein that we discovered called COP2, and it delivers material uh, to the cyst compartment either by a process of maturation or possibly by vesicle flow using a different coat protein, in this case COP1. So we wanted to evaluate uh, our hypothesis that the ergic had some role in this process by looking at intact cells, and so we've looked at a variety of cultured cells uh, at using conditions that block traffic from the ER to the intermediate compartment uh, that, that are effective in cells. There are two inhibitors that we chose that have been useful. One is a, an inhibitor uh, of protein kinase A, but which at a, at a higher concentration blocks the generation of COP2 vesicles that bud from the ER. It's a drug called H89. Another drug of a less well-characterized mechanism called clofibrate also blocks traffic out of the ER and uh, collapses the ergic compartment within a few minutes. Um, H89, after a 20-minute incubation, the cis-Golgi compartment uh, begins to become delocalized, whereas clofibrate really c completely disperses the cis-Golgi marker uh, throughout the cell. Now, interestingly, when these drugs are uh, exposed to uh, normal cells, under conditions where the ergic compartment disappears, within 20 minutes, membranes isolated from those cells appear to have lost their ability to template the lipidation of LC3. That's shown here. After just 20 minute of treatment, H89 and clofibrate uh, produce these, ce these cells are no longer able to lipidate LC3 in our cell-free reaction, whereas uh, agents that block the secretory pathway at later stages uh, are much less potent in destroying this templating activity. H8, the effect of H89 in vivo is reversible. If you wash the drug out, the ergic is restored within minutes, and as you'll see in the next slide, the ability to lipidate LC3 is also very rapidly restored. So here is uh, this washout experiment. After just two minutes um, of H89 removal, Membranes isolated from these cells are now beginning to restore their ability to lipidate LC3, and it seems to be fully restored after just five minutes. The kinetics of restoration of lipidation activity mirror uh, the rate at which the ergic compartment reappears and precedes by some minutes the full restoration of the cis-Golgi compartment as measured by uh, the marker put in GM130. So what is it about this membrane? I mean, uh, it's not PE, it must be something else. As I said, all the lipidation components are purely cytoplasmic proteins, so there must be something in the membrane that serves as a receptor to uh, perhaps to receive the enzyme complex BPS34 to lipidate, uh, uh, to uh, form PI3P, and uh, perhaps some other molecule that, that serves to anchor the lipidation components. We don't know what that receptor or receptors uh, is or are, but we're pretty sure it's a membrane protein because we've done a really simple classic experiment to demonstrate that, which you'll see in this slide. Um, if membranes, either crude membranes or the purified ergic membrane, are exposed on ice to trypsin, increasing concentrations of trypsin, the ability of these membranes to promote lipidation of LC3 is gradually destroyed. The conditions of proteolysis that we use don't just dissolve the membrane because one of the membrane markers of the ergic is perfectly preserved during this condition of trypsin treatment, and that's because this protein, its um, peptide domains, are buried within the lumen of the ergic compartment, and they're not then directly accessible to protease. Whereas the other marker of the ergic, SEC22B, which is exposed largely on the cytoplasmic surface of the membrane, is exquisitely sensitive to proteolysis. So this simple experiment suggests that there's some membrane protein, presumably an integral membrane protein or proteins, 
in this ergic compartment, and we're very busy trying to figure out what those proteins are. Um, so back to uh, the, the model. So we think this is a special membrane involved in the elaboration of the phagophore. And um, Leong then considered how this ergic compartment may give rise to the phagophore. There were two simple ideas. One is that the ergic compartment would somehow be withdrawn from the secretory pathway and would just grow by the uh, addition of membrane material to create a phagophore. Um, if that were true, uh, you, you might expect this process of induction of autophagy to interfere with secretion that would remove this essential compartment. And that seems not to be true. Cells that are starved that, uh, under conditions of induction of autophagy continue to secrete for a while. So Leon considered another, it seemed to me, less likely possibility, but still uh, feasible, uh, uh, possible, and that is that the ergic membrane uh, serves to create a special population of uh, new transport vesicles uh, that are diverted to this to the goal to the role of producing a phagophore. These vesicles would then bud from the ergic and perhaps by homotypic fusion create the phagophore membrane. And he developed some evidence to support this. I'll show you just part of it. His initial observation was that when you starve cells for uh, the induction of autophagy, uh, the most active membrane that templates the lipidation of LC3 is a very small membrane fraction that sediments only at 100,000 times G. In other words, the ergic membrane, which sediments at 25,000 times G, after cells starve, is le was less active than a small vesicle fraction uh, produced by just a 20-minute starvation condition. So he <laughs> thought, well, maybe that's um, the source of this uh, material to generate a phagophore. So um, he then did the following experiment that suggested that there might be some unusual change in the machinery for ves vesicle formation that accompanies the starvation reaction. He asked whether ergic membranes isolated from starved cells acquire components for the two coat proteins that I mentioned that are responsible for traffic into and out of the ergic uh, compartment. Uh, the coat proteins that he looked at are subunits of the machinery required for COP2 vesicle formation, a nucleotide exchange catalyst that's an integral membrane protein called SEC12 normally resides almost exclusively in the ER membrane, or two subunits of the COP2 coat, a small GTPase, and a coat subunit SEC23. And he compared these uh, markers to a standard subunit of the COP1 coat, the beta subunit of the COP1 coat. He found, really quite surprisingly, that when ergic membranes are harvested from cells that are starved for a brief time, SEC12, a fraction of the SEC12 protein, appears to migrate from the ER into the ergic, where it is seen quite prominently in starved but not in unstarved cells, and where its uh, appearance is reduced if the cells are treated with wartmannan during the starvation reaction. So apparent, an apparent requirement for PI3P in the movement of this uh, nucleotide exchange catalyst, SEC12, from the ER to the ergic membranes. Correspondingly, there is an appearance of two of the COP2 subunits in this ergic fraction, whereas COP1, the coat responsible for traffic from the ergic to the Cis-Golgi back and forth, is not similarly enriched during this starvation reaction. Well, he did many other things. I'm going to just focus on one additional experiment. Uh, Liang asked, can you actually isolate various membranes after starvation and see which of the membranes, including the ergic, is most um, uh, uh, active in the formation of small vesicles that can template the lipidation of LC3? So he used uh, a reaction that we've used in the lab over many years in yeast and mammalian cells to generate small vesicles by a budding process, starting with larger membranes from a crude lysate. That assay is shown here. Um, he started in this case with membranes obtained from starved cells, uh, all of which uh, were large enough to sediment at uh, a medium speed, 
So the incubation is conducted starting with these medium speed membranes and cytosol from starved cells. Uh, an incubation is conducted with um, nucleotides, uh, GTP, and an ATP regenerating system. Small vesicles form in such reactions that will not centrifuge at uh, low or medium speed. They require high speed, 100,000 G for sedimentation. So he collected the supernatant and sedimented at high speed. And then, as you'll see in the, last, in the next slide, he could evaluate which, mem which membrane from a lysate was the richest source of material to produce a membrane that could template lipidation of LC3. So I focused just on, on this one experiment. In the lysate, by fractionation, he could obtain membranes that sediment at low speed, including the nucleus and mitochondrial membrane, a separate fraction that was enriched in ER, um, an ergic fraction, whose isolation I've already described, and then uh, other membranes. Each of these fractions could be separated uh, partially and then subjected to this vesicle budding reaction. And strikingly, it was the ergic membrane from starved cells that was most potent in producing small vesicles that serve as a, a template for the lipidation of LC3. So this and other experiments led us to uh, suggest that uh, these vesicles uh, may be responsible, uh, that, that it's the ergic that generates uh, vesicles. And in other experiments, Liang showed that it's, in fact, the COP2 machinery that somehow is uh, diverted to this goal of producing what we think is a, a, a distinct subset of vesicles that may precede the formation of the phagophore. Now, in the last experiments from this part of the talk, I want to show you some uh, uh, images of fluorescence images of cells that give comfort to this idea. So um, we've used confocal microscopy um, to visualize uh, the ergic compartment <coughs> in uh, starved cells or starved cells treated with Wartmannin. Uh, if you can look just at uh, unstarved cells, uh, what he found is that a marker of, uh, of COP2, in this case SEC31, and the ergic protein, ergic 53, uh, lie very close to one another in uh, apparent contact uh, with each other. Um, he observed after starvation for just 20 minutes that the images of these two proteins seem largely to be superimposed. They go from being closely opposed to uh, largely opposed, uh, lar largely superimposed, and that a change appears to be inhibited by Wartmannin during this 20 minute incubation. It's not so easy to see the images. We've quantified a number of puncti from these cells, and there is a very clear effect of starvation in bringing these two marker proteins uh, closer together. We've been able to see this um, in better images that were uh, published uh, recently using super resolution microscopy. So let me summarize uh, these two stories of Liang's in the form of a model that we're continuing to explore. The idea is that starvation somehow induces the movement of at least part of the COP2 machinery from the ER, from ER exit sites, to this ergic compartment, where it then engages in the selection of uh, membranes uh, for capture into a transport vesicle that are the most potent uh, templates for lipidation of LC3. We imagine, but certainly have not demonstrated, that these vesicles may, by a process of fusion, generate the phagophore. Uh, and which then grows by the acquisition of other membranes from other sources to create the autophagosome. Um, the virtue of all this is that it's all in a cell-free system, and it will now allow Liang, uh, as he remains in my lab and moves on to his own lab, to fractionate the system and to study this um, in a great deal more depth mechanistically. So I'm quite excited by the prospects uh, as well as what we've learned thus far. Now, I'd like to turn in the remaining time to a related project uh, that came through a, an interesting idea suggested by Min Zhang, who's now a postdoc in the lab. When she started in the lab, she said she was interested in uh, the process of unconventional secretion of small proteins. This is a field that has been explored for many years um, with many different uh, techniques and different ideas about how proteins can bi somehow bypass the secretory pathway. One, one particular target of a great deal of investigation is the, an interleukin called IL-1 beta, which is a major cytokine involved in the inflammatory response. 
A uh, variety of cells, macrophages, neutrophils, monocytes, uh, can be induced to secrete IL-1 beta uh, in a path that is apparently independent of the secretory path, because you can block the secretory pathway with a drug, rifeldin, and not block the secretion of IL-1 beta. Three years ago, a um, very interesting paper was published in the EMBO journal that suggested that autophagy was required for the secretion of IL-1 beta under conditions where the interleukin is secreted when cells are stressed. And that seemed very bizarre. Why should autophagy be required for an unconventional secretion path? So um, Min was very interested in this because the suggestion in the paper from several years ago didn't seem consistent with what we know about the topology of how proteins can be secreted um, in the normal secretory pathway. So here is uh, a cartoon that Min drew for me when she proposed this experiment. Um, we know that proteins that are secreted by the standard pathway have to be translocated across a membrane. And uh, once that happens, a vesicle that fuses with the plasma membrane will secrete a soluble protein. I mean, this is just standard uh, known for many decades. But the suggestion from Voyoderatech in 2011 that autophagy was required for secretion of IL-1 beta didn't make any sense to us because if you envelop this cytosolic protein within the interior uh, of a phagophore that closes on itself to form an autophagosome. And if this autophagosome fuses with the plasma membrane, you would produce uh, an extracellular vesicle that enclosed IL-1 beta. You wouldn't actually produce a purely soluble secreted form of IL-1 beta. So that didn't, didn't make a lot of sense to us. And so Min suggested something that made even less sense to me, which was namely that this protein may actually, rather than being engulfed by the autophagosome, may be translocated across the exposed membrane of the phagophore uh, to be localized within the clear luminal space of the phagophore envelope. And if that were so, then fusion of the autophagosome with the plasma membrane would actually release soluble IL-1 beta. So that made sense in a, in, a, in a way, but didn't make sense that the cell would go to this trouble. Still, it seemed like an attractive <coughs> idea, and so um, we set about to uh, first to reproduce Deratex observations, which we were able to do. Uh, we did so by reconstituting the process of uh, secretion of IL-1 beta in a cell line that we could use conveniently, HEC-293 cells removing it from the normal macrophage or monocyte or neutrophil, which is uh, more difficult to manipulate in the laboratory. So what Amin did was she took the genes for IL-1 beta and for the protease responsible for processing IL-1 beta, caspase-1, and simply uh, made stably transfected forms of HEC293 cells. As you'll see in the next slides, she was able to reproduce the secretion of mature IL-1 beta on starvation under conditions where autophagy is induced and show that, in fact, autophagy really is required, at least for this form of secretion. Yes? Can I just briefly interrupt uh, for clarification so that I get the topology right in my head? Yeah. So the two in the middle should be also still engulfed when, they're ex when they are um, secreted. And so yes. the two and the one should be flipped, is this correct? <laughs> two and then one should be flipped. Right? So, so the, yeah, this right. So this the, the, the schematic include includes both ideas. The first idea of Deratex was that somehow the engulfment of IL one beta would, would could result in its secretion. Um, but but what in fact would happen is that you would secrete a large vesicle that contained IL one beta in its interior. Exactly, which is why the, the black should engulf two of them, no? Yeah. Yeah. So in this, up here, this is the standard. It's a number of dots. You have got two dots. Oh, 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 two dots. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking me two, literally. This is a, this is a cartoon. It's not a, it's not a thin section micrograph. <laughs> but but the, the black lower membrane should go around two red dots, correctly. Yeah, sure, two red dots. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely right. Uh, I really should go and, and uh, I should Photoshop this to change it. Yeah. I thought I'd ask before it doesn't make yeah. sense. 
Okay, all right. Does it, does it make sense now? It was artistic license. Okay. So the first, so let me go take a step back. So first of all, in a variety of cells, uh, including macrophages, Min was able to show that IL-1 beta that's secreted really is it's purely soluble. It's not enclosed within a membrane at all. Um, and secondly, uh, as I'll now show you, she was able to reconstitute the, uh, the stress-induced secretion of soluble mature IL-1 beta. So here's the experiment, HEC-23 cells um, transfected with the IL-1 beta gene and caspase when induced for um, a brief period under conditions of starvation, about a threefold increase in the appearance of mature IL-1 beta that was detected in the medium. A, a, a very small proportion of material uh, was remain, retained in the precursor form in the growth medium. And in MEFs, uh, cultured from the ATG5 knockout, starvation did not promote the secretion of mature IL-1 beta. Um, in the HEC-23 cells, she could show that the inhibitors of PI3 kinase uh, block, both block the secretion of mature IL-1 beta. Uh, again, consistent with the idea that maybe autophagy and all the steps in autophagy were somehow required to get IL-1 beta out of the cells. Well, then she did a series of experiments to explore the intracellular distribution of mature and precursor IL-1 beta. She used uh, the fractionation scheme that, Min, that Liang had devised to see if the mature species traveled along with the phagiform membrane or with the ergic membrane um, uh, that was produced in normal cells, not ATG5 cells, but normal cells uh, starved by serum deprivation. And so here is the fractionation scheme. You've already seen this several times. These are uh, wild-type cells. They're not ATG5 mutant cells. And she could show that the mature and precursor forms of IL-1 beta sediment in the 25,000 G pellet. They sediment together in the sucrose interface fraction. And they fractionate near the top of the gradient, uh, in this case coincident with lipidated LC3, a characteristic of the phagiform membrane, resolved from other membranes that Liang had been able to show were removed by this last fractionation step. She also, in other experiments, could show that immunoprecipitation of a membrane with an antibody against LC3 uh, also co-immunoprecipitated mature uh, IL-1 beta. So now the, the real question was, it's associated with a membrane, but how is it associated? Because if you consider the model that I started this with, the uh, mature IL-1 beta may be enclosed, engulfed within the interior of the autophagosome, or it may be trapped within the lumen of the envelope that surrounds the phagophore. Both those dispositions would be consistent with this fractionation scheme. So we really needed a, a refined test to see exactly where the protein is in, in this membrane. And we hit on the following scheme. It was to use the classic technique of protease protection to see if we could find conditions where we could show that IL-1 beta was either in the interior or in the envelope membrane. And I'm going to develop this in a couple of slides. So the, the first idea is um, if this material is engulfed within the uh, phagophore, autophagosome, it will clearly be resistant to proteases that are added to the buffer in which the phagophore membrane is suspended. And that will be true whether IL-1 beta is in the interior of the autophagosome or in the envelope uh, of the autophagosome. Both of these dispositions should uh, resist proteolytic attack if the membranes remain intact during that incubation. But what if you could block the closure of this membrane in cells uh, to produce an envelope of the phagophore that allowed both the outer surface and the inner surface to be accessible to proteolytic attack. If you could do that, if you could allow a phagophore to mature, but just to the, before the point of closure of this structure, you might be able to distinguish these two dispositions by the use of partial proteolytic treatment of isolated membranes. Well, it turns out there is such a condition uh, in the literature that 
uh, is known to blo to uh, be required for a late step in the maturation of the autophagosome, and that is a protein called ATG2. When you knock it out, the cell accumulates large envelopes of the autophagosome failing to close. And yet, as you'll see, we could show that mature IL-1 beta is produced, and as you'll see, it remains uh, within the envelope membrane. But let me show you the evidence for that. Well, the first experiment was to knock out ATG2. There are two paralogs of this gene. We used siRNA to ablate the expression of both of them, conditions that generate this structure. We could show that these membranes accumulated under this condition still fractionate as before. Uh, mature IL-1 beta is produced. Sediments at 25K is at the sucrose interface fraction and um, persists at the, in the low buoyant density fractions of the optoprep. Uh, ablating the expression of ATG2 does not interfere with lipidation of LC3. That is still there and also is in the low buoyant density fraction. So now the, the next experiment, the crucial one, was to use a control cells with, treated with a, a, a mock siRNA or cells treated under conditions where both paralogs of ATG2 are knocked down, isolate the membranes and then subject them to uh, proteolysis to see where the mature IL-1 beta is localized. That experiment is shown here. Let me run through the markers that we used. Um, we used two markers of the surfaces, the cytosolic surfaces of the autophagosome. One is lipidated LC3, which um, is partly exposed on the outer surface, but also in the inner surface, subject to degradation in the lysosome. But a receptor protein required to gather cargo molecules into the autophagosome called P62 is essentially exclusively localized on the inner surface of the mature autophagosome. So uh, P62, you would predict, would largely be resistant to proteolysis in a mature autophagosome. But if you block the closure of that auto autophagosome by knocking down ATG2, you should see P62 persist in a form that is sensitive to an exogenous protease. And if uh, IL-1 beta is engulfed within the interior, it should also be sensitive to proteolysis. It should be similarly sensitive. Whereas if IL-1 beta is translocated into the envelope, it would resist exogenous protease, whether the phagophore has closed or not. Right, the data that demonstrates that it is translocated is shown on the right. So here's a control, a control siRNA. Uh, mature IL-1 beta is about 50% resistant to a fairly high concentration of protease K in an incubation on ice. It is not resistant if the membranes are suspended in detergent, so it's not intrinsically resistant to proteolysis. The precursor IL-1 beta is mostly degraded under these conditions. It's fully degraded in the presence of detergent. Importantly, in this control, much, maybe half, of the P62 is resistant uh, to proteinase K. About less than half, slightly less than half the LC3 is resistant. They are both degraded in an incubation conducted in the presence of detergent. Now compare this behavior to the behavior of membranes isolated from the ATG2 knockout. Mature IL-1 beta continues to be resistant to the same extent in membranes from this knockout. The precursor is largely degraded as before. And note that the P62 protein is fully accessible to proteinase K. It is completely, essentially completely degraded in these membranes, which is consistent with the membrane remaining, the envelope remaining open. So importantly, if you look at the, the disparate behavior of P62 and mature IL-1 beta, this result is most consistent with a, an event, some kind of event, that uh, translocates uh, mature IL-1 beta into the envelope of the phagophore, and even into the envelope of a precursor of the phagophore membrane. OK, if this is a translocation event, uh, there should be a channel. We don't know what the channel is yet, but we're looking for it. But there may be other requirements. For example, there may be some kind of a signal, similar to a signal sequence, that would promote the transfer of IL-1 beta from the cytosol across the membrane of the phagophore. There is a pathway called um, uh, chaperone-mediated autophagy, CMA, 
that appears to involve the transfer of cytosolic proteins into the lysosome, a pathway that was uh, first understood many years ago by Fred Dice uh, that requires chaperones in the form of HSP70 uh, and uh, possibly a membrane channel, though I'm, we're not certain what that channel is. Um, that also is induced by conditions of starvation. So we thought maybe this pathway involves something like uh, that, the pathway that Dice had de described. Dice found that proteins that are subject to this pathway have a pentapeptide sequence, KFERQ, that promotes the translocation event. So Min looked within the sequence of IL-1 beta, the mature and precursor form, and using the rules that the Dice Lab had developed, the very, very degenerate rules that can define this kind of a KFERQ-like sequence, Min found uh, three regions that have similar peptide sequences that are highlighted by these red lines. She made mutations in each of the three sequences and found that mutations in two of them, each one at a time, produce a, a mutant form of IL-1 beta that is no longer secreted from cells at all. I mean, it's completely missing, and yet it continues to be proteolytically matured inside the cells. You can see that the, pre the mature form of IL-1 beta is more abundant in cells that are expressing this, these, you know, either of these mutant forms of the, of the precursor. She used the protease protection experiment, as I've just des described, to show that these mutants fail to produce a mature form of IL-1 beta that can be protease inex inaccessible. The, the normal protein is, as before, protease inaccessible, but the mutant forms remain on the cytoplasmic face of the membrane. Now, um, as I mentioned, Dice found that chaperones are required for the pathway that he defined. Um, and he showed in different experiments that both HSP90 and HSP70 are required. For, for, that, uh, for that event. We look by knockdown to see whether one or the other or both are required for our pathway. And we found in distinction to what Dice found for, for, uh, for uh, CMA, that only HSP90 was required for our event. When HSP90 is knocked down, um, Min found a threefold reduction in the secretion of mature IL-1 beta whereas no such reduction is seen when either HSP90 or the um, non-heat shock cognates of these proteins are knocked down. There is no effect on the secretion of mature IL-1 beta, um, no requirement for HSP90. In the HSP90 knockdown, on the other hand, just as before, the mature form of the protein is produced, so the caspase action activity is still retained to produce mature species, but that mature species is not translocated into the envelope of the membrane in these cells compared to untreated cells. So it blocks, there's a block in the translocation event. Well, two last experiments. One was to see whether HSP90 interacts with the signals, the putative signals that men define, and that's its role in somehow delivering uh, mature or precursor uh, um, IL-1 beta to the site for translocation. Here is one such experiment. Um, she could show that uh, an immunoprecipitation of HSP90 resulted in the precipitation of mature IL-1 beta. It re very much less of the precursor form of IL-1 beta was precipitated. Whereas when either of the mutants that fail to secrete uh, mature IL-1 beta is examined, neither of them can be precipitated by an antibody against, um, against HSP90. And finally, uh, she could show that this HSP90 IL-1 beta complex is induced dramatically by the conditions of starvation that generate an autophagosome and which also promote the secretion of IL-1 beta. And this complex is delivered to the membrane fraction and depleted from the cytosol fraction under these conditions of starvation. Well, let me summarize um, her experiment for you in the form of a very simple model slide. We imagine that HSP90 reacts, uh, interacts with IL-1 beta, possibly 
only after caste-based action to form a complex that delivers um, mature IL-1 beta to a site on a membrane as yet unidentified, a membrane that may be a precursor of the phagophore, um, a channel we predict through which mature IL-1 beta is translocated into the luminal <laughs> interior, and that on fusion of this structure with the plasma membrane or fusion with some intermediate organelle, the mature uh, uh, cytokine is secreted. Well, there are many, obviously many questions that, that we're asking. Um, the, the, the most important one is, can, the, can we further uh, understand this translocation reaction? We have other evidence that it really is a translocation reaction that requires at least a partial unfolding of mature L1 beta. Uh, and we have a candidate membrane protein that may, that may be either a receptor or a channel protein. Well, let me uh, share with you the people who've done the work that I've described. The first um, was Leon Ga, who's done all the work on the generation of the phagophore membrane and the production of vesicles from the ergic membrane. And uh, Min Zhang, shown here, who's done uh, these very nice experiments um, on uh, the, the uh, mechanism, the really strange mechanism of secretion of IL-1 beta. Both of, both of these are terrific postdocs and they published uh, now three very <coughs> nice papers, of course, in eLife. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me take just two minutes to tell you a little bit about what I do with all my time, which is to promote this journal and why I'm so passionate about it. Um, five years ago now, the leaders of the Wellcome Trust uh, the Max Planck Society and Howard Hughes gathered together for a meeting at Genelia Farm, one of the research uh, <laughs> centers for, uh, for the Howard Hughes Institute. Um, and uh, Mark Wolpert, who was then the president of the Wellcome Trust, started the meeting with an impassioned plea that scientists, Wellcome Trust scientists, indeed life scientists from around the world, were having to struggle too much uh, under difficult conditions to publish their most important work. You know, there are thousands of journals of the life sciences, and yet uh, everyone here dies to have their papers published in Cell, Nature, and Science. These journals have, uh, as their business plan, the creation of a club, a special club that you all want to be a member of. And they do so by a variety of uh, very clever business policies. Uh, one of which is to make it very difficult to get your paper in. And one of the reasons is they assemble a team of anonymous characters um, <laughs> who stand in the way of the publication of your work. They do so by a variety of means uh, that we can talk about. Um, one of them, though, is uh, by relying on what a number that I consider really a phony number, but which all the postdocs know to three significant figures. It's called the journal impact factor. These journals uh, uh, manage the process of securing only a small number of papers because they are, uh, uh, I think, unduly influenced by fad, fad and fashion in biology. Mark Wolpert and the leaders of the organizations that founded eLife were most concerned that active scientists now wrest control of the literature from the professional editors who make the decisions about which papers are reviewed and published in the largely commercial journals of Cell, Nature, and Science. And so four years ago, a little over four years ago, I gathered together a group of uh, scholars from around the world to form the editorial board for this new journal called eLife, an open access journal. I can tell you more about it if you're interested. I just wanted to give you kind of a brief summary of our progress. Um, the submissions over the four-year period of growth of eLife have been skyrocketing. We're now uh, uh, close to 600 submissions a month, which is pretty good for a brand new journal. We're publishing increasing numbers, I think, of uh, very effective papers covering all of the life sciences. Um, we published, um, we've, we've passed a milestone this past year, having published our 1,000th paper, and in aggregate, we publish more life science papers than either nature, science, or cell, <coughs> any more than PLOS biology. One of the things that we do uh, that I think is special is the way we review papers uh, that l allows us to have a faster turnaround time. We don't, we, we've tried very hard to avoid this, the kinds of endless cycles of back and forth, 
that many of you have experienced with the commercial journals. And as a result, our turn time from submission to acceptance, including the time that it takes for an author to respond to criticisms, is uh, better than the competition. We're now running about four months, considerably better than nature and cell. Well, um, not everyone uh, has the same feelings that I do about uh, the evils of journal impact factor as a measure of success in science. I recently was sent a, tw uh, a tweet from a Twitter feed uh, formed with the idea that as Donald Trump starts to lose influence in the Republican nomination for president in the, in the United States, there was apparently some speculation that he might replace Francis Collins as the director of the, of the NIH. Imagine that. <laughs> Donald Trump is the director of the NIH. Well, someone, someone imagined this and wrote a tweet that um, was promoting what Donald Trump would do uh, at the NIH. Here it is. Don, there he is, Donald Trump, director of the NIH. Huge news. We won negotiations with Macmillan. All nature journals to be rebranded Trump. <laughs> All will be with an impact factor greater than 50. <laughs> Suck it, Checkman. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. on Eli, uh, and for the Eli button, I put it on. In return, uh, I have uh, the IMP work for you, okay. and I hope you will put it on too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> IMP button, the end of the day, button. <laughs> I'm sure there's questions. questions. Um, did you have a look by uh, electron microscopy, whether you generate double membrane vesicles? We've looked at the, at the ergic membranes as we've isolated, but I don't think we've looked uh, at thin sections of membranes after the budding reaction. Um, we could do that, but we, we haven't done that. Well, do you have something specific that you thought we, we might do? No, just because you see LC3 uh, lipidation in these fractions, whether yeah. you actually uh, generate a complete or in your... Oh, okay, yeah, oh, the, that's uh, what you're uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we did an experiment um, early on to see if we could carry the reaction all the way to closure of the phagophore, starting with, uh, with the ergic membrane. The way we did this was we asked, can we make lipidated LC3 that becomes, uh, after a longer period of incubation, resistant to exogenous protease? And that, that didn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't go all the way to completion, or at least not very efficiently. So um, there are ways that, you know, that one could carry on, but we, we thought focusing on the early events was complicated enough. So, so uh, dominant native SAR1 is predicted then, based on yep. what you say, to actually inhibit L1 secretion. Um, uh, I think this is not yeah, the case. We, that is a prediction, but um, we, we, we can show, we confirm that Rafeldin A does not block secretion of I1 beta, but uh, may, maybe we should also really should look at H89. H89 should block I1 beta. We, we haven't done that yet. Anything to do. Right now, Min is out on maternity leave, so the work is coming from all. Joseph? So, how, how many cytokines do you believe actually use this pathway? Yeah. And secondly, would there be a teleologic evolutionary reason why you know, the cell uses such an intricate pathway yeah. to, to do this? Uh, I wish I could answer either of those questions. We, we focused exclusively on IL 1 data. But it seems logical that other cytokines would use this, but we, we haven't done that. Simple. simple. Yeah. Why this pathway is really a, it's hard to imagine. Um, um, it, uh, obviously, this is a membrane that is generated during condi conditions of stress, uh, and so maybe the cell has just exploited this pathway. Uh, we have, I, I can't answer your question, so the rest would just be. Yes, so let, let me focus on what we can do. Um, we have a candidate membrane protein that is either the receptor or the channel. We showed uh, we were able to uh, trap tra the translocation using a fusion, a DHFR fusion to IL-1 beta. 
in the presence of the drug in an operon that blocks the unfolding of DHFR. We can block the translocation event. We used membranes from that condition um, with a chemical crosslinker to identify a membrane protein that is enriched, bound to translocating uh, mature L1 data. We have produced a, a, a null allele of that uh, the gene for that protein, and the cells are completely uh, grow completely normally, but um, the IL1 beta is no longer secreted. So uh, I think with that mutant, we can now add other, <coughs> other, there are other cargo molecules that are dependent on that. It's obviously not required for secretion because these cells are growing perfectly normally. And maybe that would help us address you know, why this thing, where it comes from, what, what, what the whole point of it is. It is bizarre, I, I agree with that. To this point, Randy, so to, to your discussion, is it true that IL1 beta is it, I mean, secretion is induced by starvation? Is that the only way of regulating? No. So IL-1 or? beta, in, in the normal uh, situation, it's, indu its secretion is induced by activation of the inflammasome. So this is not, uh, this is not the usual way that one studies the secretion of IL-1 beta. Um, it can be induced by, by uh, starvation even uh, in, uh, in macrophages, but it's primarily involved in, in the inflammatory re reaction. Uh, so one one criticism may be that this pathway that we've studied by reconstituting in HEC293 cells is not the normal path for secretion of IL-1 beta. So um, if we can, with this putative channel protein that we have, I think we could go back now and, and look at the more natural cells that are the, 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 the home for IL-1 beta secretion to see if the, this pathway is used, uh, used there as well. Like well, the mouse mutants that exist, right? Yeah, maybe, yeah, right. This particular gene, I don't. I think there is a, there may be a mouse and all. It probably is an embryonic lethal, though. So you just mentioned the inflammasome, but does the inflammasome uh, possibly, uh, when it's activated and cleaves IL-1 beta, at the same time also elicit some something like a starvation phenotype, yeah. so that autophagy would uh, yeah. would be increased and so therefore promote secretion? Yeah. You know that? So it does. It does. In fact, it's known. Um, and in fact, in macrophages. Uh, the inflammasome uh, activation induces the autophagic breakdown of IL-1 beta. So there's a, co there's a competing effect during inflammation, which is why we wanted to get away from it, where IL-1 beta is, is secreted, but also at least partially degraded by autophagy. And so that's, that makes it complicated. The other thing is that in macrophages, uh, when in inflammation is induced, a reasonable fraction of the cell's lice. And as a result, the field has been confused, I would say, by the notion that some people still have that I1 beta is not actually secreted, but it's simply released by the fraction of macrophages that lice. I think there's good evidence against that, though, because other cells, monocytes and neutrophils, that naturally secrete IL-1 beta when, they're, when the inflammation is induced, don't lice. Macrophages do, but these others don't. So I, 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 I'm persuaded that it really is secretion. Randy, thank you very much again.